Rob House, who needs no introduction, was invited by the Board of Editors of uh, EGIL to write our second forward, which will be published in the first issue of uh, 2016. Now, uh, Rob is a Renaissance scholar. He can write on legal theory, he can write on public international law, he can write on investment, he can write on WTO law. And uh, since the forward is meant to bring a sort of overview and uh, conceptualization of the state of the art in the broad area of EGIL, of public international law, uh, you chose to focus on the WTO. And some of our readers might think that that is an odd choice given that the WTO seems to be, uh, if not in crisis, at least in the doldrums, the DOA exercise is a failure. So explain the choice of a look at the WTO as the focus for your forward. So one face of the WTO is the uh, failure of the DOA negotiations, um, the um, impression of um, an impasse uh, as far as developing um, new agreements, um, a questioning of the relevance of the WTO in a world of regional trade negotiations. The other face of the WTO, however, um, that we've seen over the last 20 years has been the development of um, a uh, system of adjudication that's been uh, the envy of uh, many, many uh, public international uh, lawyers, where hundreds of claims are considered, uh, where most of the decisions are implemented, at least uh, to some extent, and where, in contrast to investor state arbitration, which is facing a full-scale um, legitimacy crisis, uh, you've had uh, an appellate court in the WTO that has decided issues as controversial as uh, issues about animal rights, um, renewable energy, um, uh, endangered species, uh, and yet uh, seems uh, to have um, one relatively broad acceptance for its rulings, not that you know, every activist group agrees with every decision, but uh, where um, the judicial system of the WTO hasn't uh, been the subject of sustained attack. So that's a remarkable achievement, and um, it, what interested me um, in, um, in selecting this theme for the foreword is how does this, um, you know, uh, judicial dynamism relate to either the reality or the narrative of the WTO as a moribund um, international institution. What's going on there? There definitely is this kind of tension between uh, what seems to be stasis on uh, the political side and uh, quite the opposite of stasis on the judicial side and that will be, that is one of the themes you pick up in your forward. But uh, before we get to this Two little uh, questions. One is, at the start of the game, there was a big debate about what to call uh, the body, and it, the final decision was this horrible name, the appellate body. Apparently, the Congress of the United States would not entertain calling it a court. I've always thought of it as the World Trade Court. Would you agree uh, with that appellation? Uh, I, I would agree with that, and um, uh, those um, readers who make it uh, through till the end of my foreword uh, will see that, um, that my bottom line is that the WTO appellate body has come of age as a true world trade court. So now on the coming of age, uh, I remember some years ago <clears throat> I did some empirical research and this really does relate to the earlier stages of the appellate body. And one of the things were, which intrigued me was the obsessive citation and reference to uh, the interpretation clause of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties and what I considered an excessive use of dictionaries as a tool of interpretation. I found at the time that in over 50% of the cases when there was a question of interpretation, a dictionary was brought out 
I compared that to the European Court of Justice and in thousands of cases I could find three uses of dictionary. Uh, that too has changed, hasn't it? It's part of the narrative of maturation. Uh, absolutely. And um, in the foreword I offer some hypotheses uh, as to what might have been um, the underlying motivations for what would seem to be a, a relatively you know, a primitive um, way of, um, uh, of engaging in uh, judicial uh, uh, hermeneutics. And um, I was quite um, uh, struck when I found a statement by one of the uh, early members of the appellate body, um, uh, Georges uh, Abisab, uh, that in fact um, there were other things going on beneath the surface uh, right, right, from the, um, right from the beginning. And um, that in fact the, the early appellate body was not, you know, this low-level uh, kind of adjudicator that you might think uh, with this rigid and rote, you know, recourse uh, to, to the dictionaries. Now why the dictionary and, and a kind of mechanical application of the Vienna Convention? Um, my thesis is that the appellate body was trying to distance itself from the um, the heritage of the late GATT. So we, we have with the creation of the WTO this new dispute settlement system. Um, I would say that the trade policy negotiators who created the appellate body probably thought of it as uh, there to uh, correct um, the odd you know, crazy decision that would go against the kind of conventional wisdom of the of the organization, the the insiders, um, the secretariat, and and so forth, about the appropriate meaning of um, uh, of the law and 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 policy and the policies behind it. But when this new system gets started, all of a sudden we have a fundamental questioning of globalization. We have a fundamental questioning of the telos uh, uh, of what Danny Roderick calls deep integration that seems to have been the main thrust of the Uruguay round negotiations and the agreements that um, those negotiations created on um, intellectual property, services, subsidies, and, and so forth. And so this creates a real legitimacy challenge if you, know, if you start to engage in teleological interpretation, you kind of adopt um, a, and a, and a key of principles and, and notions from uh, the late GATT era or from the neoliberal orientation of the secretariat at a time when that orientation is profoundly being questioned and protested against publicly. So, so the appellate body decides to start from, you know, from the beginning and, and how more you know, radically to distance oneself from teleological interpretation and to avoid getting into the question of the extent to which um, the norms are intended to support neoliberal globalization, Washington consensus, and so on, to just cut that off at the pass and say, we're starting with the text. If there's a problem in understanding a word in the text, we're going to go to uh, the dictionary. We're not going to go to documents from uh, the secretariat or views of the negotiators about the liberalization telos that they thought that they were promoting and their negotiating history. We're going to read the text as if it's a kind of, um, you know, finely negotiated equilibrium where every word matters to, you know, just the extent to which um, the parties have limited their, 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 their sovereignty. And when the appellate body had established its independence um, from uh, what one might call the neoliberal telos and, uh, and, the, and the institution where that telos dominated, 
they could felt freer to be much more explicit about what they were doing, uh, and that's, you know, um, in fact, striking a very, as I would put it, fine equilibrium between uh, the need to discipline protectionism to maintain the confidence that there's a real discipline against discrimination on the one hand, but to preserve the right to regulate and avoid, you know, a, a legitimacy crisis from, um, you know, the perception or reality of undue intrusion into policy space. So, in a way, I mean, last year was 20 years, and what your forward does, and in my view, quite successfully, is not simply to give us a history of the appellate body over the last 20 years, but it's a real historiography. There's a thesis there. Could you, for the benefit of uh, the viewers, give the, the main lines of the historiography uh, a way to tease their appetite to go in and uh, read the article? Well, um, the first part of it could be uh, and is described uh, in the foreword as the appellate body's declaration of independence, which is, uh, in a way, what I've just been um, speaking about, which is the idea that it needed to take distance from, um, you know, from the uh, from the institution and uh, from um, what I would call the neoliberal aura that surrounded the institution um, in the uh, uh, or some would say pejoratively taint that uh, that characterized the institution around the time the WTO was born in the mid in the mid uh, 90 so mm, there's a variety of techniques they use to um, to create that distance and one of them uh, we've just discussed which is the dictionary mechanical use of the Vienna Convention and almost no reliance on on the decisions uh, of uh, you know in the in the in the GATT era which preceded the WTO almost no reliance explicit reliance on negotiating history but What's, what's interesting also, and this is, I think, part of what you um, usefully call the historiography, is, you know, that the appellate body was able to, to get away with this Declaration of Independence, in part because of uh, political and diplomatic divisiveness and stasis. Um, actually, stasis is not probably the precise word, but divisiveness and 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 the and the the self understanding of the institution that it was in a kind of in a kind of impasse. Um, and to understand how that's possible, we have to understand one of the main changes between the GATT era and the new WTO dispute settlement system, which is about voting rules. And so, in order to um, change WTO law or even reinterpret it uh, in a manner that's binding, essentially you have to have a positive consensus of members. Um, but judicial rulings by the appellate body are adopted by so-called negative consensus, which is that, um, you know, uh, unless essentially every member objects, uh, those rulings become binding. So what does this mean? It means that you have to have a consensus of the organization to overturn an appellate body ruling. So in the early years where the appellate body appeared much more sensitive to non-trade values than was characteristic of the, of the institution, uh, and you had attacks on the appellate body by delegates and shrimp turtle, attacks for allowing amicus briefs in, the asbestos dispute, and so on, ultimately these attacks could be resisted because of the background rules uh, of decision making. In order to truly carry out the threat to shut down this different independent approach of the appellate body, the members would have to form a consensus to, to overrule but you, it. But part of the thrust of your writing is that it has been successful that now even inside it's not considered as a sort of maverick uh, mm. radical but uh, a linchpin of the whole system. 
Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because of the um, uh, the degree of divisiveness about the future political direction or institutional direction of the WTO, um, it's really been the dispute settlement system that can be pointed to as as a success, as a raison d'etre uh, to have. Uh, the WTO. So at a certain point the attacks of the insiders um, subside and the, and, the, and the dispute settlement system and the appellate body are trotted out you know, as a sign of the vitality uh, you know, uh, uh, of the WTO and in a way its indispensability to maintaining legal discipline in, in have, trade relations. Have you, you noticed given the divisiveness and the inability to reach consensus on large issues, but also on sort of smaller issues of a greater strategic use of dispute settlement by the members of the WTO? Absolutely. Take the issue of renewable energy, um, an issue that you know, would have made the Doha negotiations more relevant had it been added uh, to the negotiations. But the then Director General of the WTO, Pascal Lamy, had this kind of uh, rigid, obstinate insistence that one could not adjust the Doha uh, agenda. Either you know, one got everything in Doha and then moved on, or we don't move on. So there have been a large number of cases, um, some of them about domestic content requirements, some of them about subsidies uh, or both like the Canada renewable energy case. Um, I think that many of the issues surrounding renewable energy and trade uh, would have been very appropriate for a new era negotiation, but they ended up in, in extensive litigation and in fact in litigation wars between countries like India and the but United the, States. The issue is that since a court does not determine its docket, it's dependent on the disputes that are brought to it, that countries are using the WTO as a new arena, as a different arena to resolve policy issues which yes. normally would have been done in the political arena of the Absolutely. WTO. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and again, that reflects a lack of confidence of getting any kind of constructive or forward-looking uh, political outcome. Now, there has been a literature uh, it used to be a fad, which had two, two, two thrusts to it. One is to try and compare and show similarities between, you know, the WTO kind of going in the footsteps of the European Court of Justice and the European Union, and even setting that up as the, the, the light to which it should be followed. And then it became also very trendy to speak about constitutionalization and constitutionalization of uh, the WTO system and for many years you were among those like myself who resisted this kind of both follow that trend and the use of constitutionalization as a useful uh, concept both explanatory but also normative. Say a word how that fits in with your view of what the appellate body has been doing. <coughs> well I think it's one should first of all point out that different scholars have used constitutionalization in different ways. Um, to my mind, the least misleading way and, and perhaps even an illuminating way is the way in which the late Deborah Cass used it, which was really um, in early scholarship that um, identified some of the tendencies that I discuss in the, in the foreword. Um, uh, and, uh, then there were others who used it, I think, in a much more normative sense to suggest that, you know, the TLS of the WTO is, you know, a kind of global libertarian type constitution like, like Petersmann. But uh, to my mind, the rejection of constitutionalism by the appellate body has now been, uh, is now very clear. And, uh, I would point out a passage in a, not, uh, t a case that's fairly recent, the China 
um, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, case. Uh, one of the one of the cases was China, where the appellate body uh, basically uh, says uh, that um, it's it's the um, it's the raw materials case where they basically say that. Um, there is an inherent right to regulate, and the disciplines of WTO law are specifically negotiated uh, limitations on the inherent right uh, uh, to regulate. And so this, to my mind, is a very anti-constitutional doctrine. It's, it suggests that there's no kind of constitutional telos to um, move towards um, kind of strong liberal outcome, but instead that, that states have made a very specific bargain in, in certain particular respects um, uh, to, curb their, uh, to curb their sovereignty. So in a way, we're almost back in the land of lotus uh, in that sense, and very far away from the notion that these bargains are just particular stepping stones on a way to you know, a full global liberal uh, constitution, liberal economic liberal constitution. One of the interesting that happened uh, in the WTO, and in some ways it was surprising that it happened in the WTO, was uh, the move away from uh, the intergovernmental and secrecy nature of the dispute settlement process uh, by opening it up both to, in a first move, I think, to amicus curiae briefs, and then even opening up uh, the process with some limitations to an open judicial process. Uh, it's not a secret military tribunal that decides in camera. And uh, you have some interesting experiences yourself, which you reference in the article, and maybe you want to say a word about that, because I think it's of some fundamental significance in the story you tell. So uh, one of the first um, uh, uh, stages of this was the decision of the uh, appellate body that the panels and the appellate body itself could accept uh, amicus briefs from non-governmental actors. There's no explicit authority to do so, but uh, um, the appellate body found that it, it had the inherent discretion of a judicial body um, to do that. And it was a controversial decision. Very. With resistance coming from all kinds of quarters, both in the developed and the developing world. Yes, and, and so, uh, I mean, as part, this was one of the more radical, viewed from the uh, perspective of the time, aspects of what I call the Declaration of Independence. Essentially, the appellate body is saying, we can enter into a relationship with actors outside the institution on our own terms. It doesn't have to be mediated by, by the delegates. And so they were in a way challenging the notion that the idea of the WTO as a member-driven institution and a club also has to dictate the way that the judicial branch uh, operates. And I think what they were really saying is we're a judicial branch. I mean, you can keep NGOs out of the dispute settlement body or out of political deliberations if you want to. But we operate as a judiciary on the basis of you know, principles, relevant principles of rule of law. And, and to us, this seems to be um, a logical course of action given you know, our ethos, our values. And, and again, it goes back to uh, the notion that it, it took much controversy and acrimony to disabuse the members of, which was that ultimately the members control the dispute settlement system. And when you get to uh, uh, five or six years ago, and one of the in my opinion, one of the best appellate body members, David Unterhalter, makes an explicit statement. The members don't control this institution. You, you, that's not a, the way that a judicial branch operates. It has, it, in fact, its legitimacy is really dependent on uh, independence and, and distance. But at first, the, you know, the ethos was that it's we could... It's not only the members, and that also comes out well in your paper, 
because there's a third actor, the sort of internal institutional actor, the secretariat, so yes. the panel, the secretariat, oh, quite of right. a, a quite right. body. I mean, that's another sort of power focal point in this game. Uh, say something about that, because there's interesting stuff in the piece also on that relationship. Uh, right. Well, um, traditionally, um, uh, you know, the secretariat, and I mean through the GATT era and the early WTO era, tended to, con in a way, control the outcomes of the panel. So the panels of first instance um, are middle level diplomats primarily. Their persons have almost no experience as triers of fact, or trial advocates, or in many cases not ever uh, trained in law. And so that provides an opportunity for the bureaucracy, the legal bureaucracy, to basically dictate the, um, the outcomes. Um, and, uh, but then the appellate body starts uh, overruling the panelists, and as you pointed out, sort of almost gratuitously um, attacks and ridicules them. So, you know, if, who would want to be a panelist? You're told by the secretariat to state some relatively inane legal notion, and then the appellate body says that you, the panelist, uh, are, are in, inane. Uh, so the dynamics really gets changed, I think, with the, um, with the appellate body. Um, but on the opening up, I, I just want to say one other thing, because um, as you rightly note, you know, it's not just amicus briefs, and eventually now that's not being challenged anymore. I still submit them. Um, a co-authored amicus brief I wrote in the Seals case was, in fact, actually cited by the panel. Um, but opening up the hearings, um, I went to attend the Seals hearings at the panel and the appellate body level. You, I was in the room, you know, and, and all of a sudden the chair of the Seals panel tells the EU attorney, um, that a panel has no authority to examine its own jurisdiction. So um, from day one, what's clear in WTO appellate body jurisprudence from the Bananas case on, and if my students made this mistake, uh, I could say right off the bat that they would have problems getting the best grade on their exams, that not only does a panel have the authority to examine its jurisdiction, it has the obligation. Um, so you had a chair of the panel who didn't even know the first thing about, about the WTO law of, of jurisdiction and procedure. So, you know, if you have a secret hearing, all that can be sort of, you know, uh, covered over. But you have somebody like me in the room who, um, you know, uh, tweets it out. I mean, the secretariat has to react immediately to that kind of a mistake. So even though there aren't a huge number of people in the room for these hearings, and some individuals have ridiculed the idea of opening it up, suggesting, well, it's boring, why would NGOs be there? There's a real control function in, in, you know, in, in not keep, there's a real va accountability value in not keeping these things secret. But, it, but as you say, it's limited because it still depends on the consent of the parties to the dispute to, um, to the hearings being public. So th there's no doubt in my mind that anybody, even with a side interest in the story of the WTO, will find this forward uh, not only an eye opener but a page turner. But as my last question, since we have to wind up, what would you say are the most interesting things for the general public international lawyer, uh, the person whose focus might still be the United Nations, uh, the use of force, uh, uh, the so-called war against terror, uh, Syria, and where uh, the decisions of the International Court of Justice in The Hague are the, 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 the sacred texts, what would be, be their interest in following this uh, story that you have been, uh, that you tell in your foreword? So, it's, uh, the, the way in which I, I, I tell the story in the, in the, in the foreword 
is very unusual for the way in which scholars write about international tribunals or most international legal scholars. Um, uh, one person uh, who was doing me a great compliment um, compared it to Alexander Bickel, which is to say that w what I'm in part trying to discern is a set of underlying you know, uh, policies uh, that, that the tribunal has, has developed to manage some of the key legitimacy challenges and dilemmas that it, that it faces. And it seems to me that one could do uh, a similar kind of approach for, uh, if not the International Court of Justice, because there are so many judges and so many different opinions and so on, but, um, uh, but for you know, the international criminal tribunals um, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, a lot of the scholarship on, uh, on international tribunals, it either focuses on numbers or focuses on whether the tribunal got this article uh, of the ILC articles on state responsibility, you know, right or wrong. Um, but, you know, there, there isn't that much focus on what might be the deep policies or, or the deep um, hermeneutic currents of the, uh, uh, of the tribunals. And that's what I've tried to do here. And I, I would welcome more of that kind of scholarship in, in other areas of, of, of public international law, not to be too immodest about the, the approach I've taken here. Not immodest at all. Uh, I want to remind our viewers uh, the forward will be out in the first issue of 2016. There will be a possibility to comment on it uh, on EGIL Talk. And as we've done with our first forward of last year, there will be an afterwards, which will be published in the last issue of 2016. So that uh, the year of EGIL, in some ways, uh, will span the life of the forward written by Rob House. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. It's my pleasure.